I'm Sue O'Connell. Tonight on Greater Boston, hundreds of thousands of people are set to lose their mass health insurance as the program reviews member qualifications for the first time in three years. What's the process going to look like and what should you do if you lose your coverage? Then later, former Red Sox player and 2004 World Series champion Bronson Arroyo. He joins me on this year's annual Boston charity show, Hot Stove Cool Music. In the early days of the pandemic, the state's Medicaid insurance program, MassHealth, put a pause on its reviews to determine if its members still qualify. But now, for the first time in three years, that annual review is underway, and the program expects around 300,000 people will lose their coverage. MassHealth covers around 2 million disabled and low-income adults and children in the state, though officials have said they believe the review will largely affect able-bodied adults whose financial circumstances changed since the height of the pandemic. And joining me to discuss what this will look like and what patients can expect are the Assistant Secretary for Mass Health, Michael Levine, President and CEO of the Massachusetts League of Community Health Centers, Michael Curry, and Jennifer Smith, a staff reporter at Commonwealth Magazine, who's been covering the eligibility review. Jennifer, I just want to start with you and welcome to all of you. Um, what's the story here? What's happening? So as you mentioned, Sue, what we're seeing is something that has been kind of on pause for three years. People are going to start receiving notifications that they're being either reconsidered for eligibility for mass health and the government needs a bit more information from them, or they're in good shape and they can expect that their coverage will automatically be renewed. And the reason that this might seem like it's kind of coming out of nowhere for people is because, as you mentioned, there was a pause because we got federal funding from the government and part of that came with the the requirement that we just automatically re-enroll the people who are in most need of this coverage. And Michael Levine, it's important to note that, again, this, this would be an annual review that would have happened anyway, but because of COVID, it was, it was paused. Um, and you're not going to do this. It didn't just all happen on April 1st, right? Now, this is absolutely a marathon and not a sprint. So the federal government has been clear and we've been clear that we're going to take the next 12 months to work through our full 2.3 million member caseload, uh, sending out renewal forms every month to about a 12th of our members um, to give everyone uh, the opportunity and the chance to work through the eligibility process, confirm that they are eligible for mass health, or find affordable coverage on the connector if they on the on the health connector if they are not eligible for mass health. How much of a heavy list, lift, Michael Levine, is this for your department, um, you know, having now to do sort of a backlog? I imagine lots of folks, I, I, I'm, you know, I'm dealing with a young adult <laughs> in my household who I'm reminding you have to open the mail when it comes in okay. and you have to check your voicemail when they call. Uh, I imagine that there's a lot of challenge here and work that your, your office has to do here to, to get the message out. This is our number one priority this year. Uh, you know, the North Star for us is preserving universal coverage in Massachusetts. And the only way you do that is making sure that everyone who's eligible for mass health stays enrolled and everyone who's not eligible for mass health, again, finds affordable insurance on the health connector or with an employer. Um, the good news is, you know, we've done this before. Normal course of business prior to COVID was that we renewed you every year. I think what makes it hard, what makes this a, a heavy lift is really two things. One, our caseload is much higher than it was prior to COVID. We've grown from 1.8 million members to 2.3 million members, and that means more people that we have to renew. Um, and also, you know, we're we're all collectively a little out of practice. Um, we've we've continued to send uh, our members, um, you know, requests to confirm their eligibility over the last couple of years, but it's going to really start mattering this year. So we need to make sure that members are aware. Uh, and one of the ways in which we're doing that is we're not just relying on the mail. We're going to be texting. We're going to be emailing. We have community partners who are knocking on doors. There's a lot of work underway to really get the word out to ensure that uh, people know they need to take action. Michael, the, uh, Michael Curry, the other concern here, obviously, is that um, areas of our community who may be more most impacted are black and brown members are, of our community. Also, you know, that terrible quandary of you made just a little bit more money than you did before, and now you are disqualified. And as Michael Levine says, hopefully you'll be able to find coverage, but that 
that terrible you've gotten forward now we're going to move you back a second uh trap that that our system seemed to do what are your concerns and and how are you addressing them yeah so one credit to mike levine who uh you know as we started this conversation weeks ago said hey michael i need to come by the office and meet with you and figure out how we can do this together and do it in a responsible way we also have had that conversation uh, with the newly appointed Secretary of Health and Human Services, Kate Walsh, and the governor as well. So, you know, we're, you, we're fortunate to be in Massachusetts because we get it and we do still fight, face challenges, but we try to do that together in a way that uh, much of the rest of the country does not do. That being said, vulnerable people face the same circumstances. If, if the state is out of practice, then know that we're out of practice in getting the mail and checking the mail and going through the process of being redetermined which means that I may lose coverage. And, and Mike knows this term we use in health policy, we call it churn. People are on coverage, then they're not covered, they get a job, they don't have a job, and they're bouncing between different types of coverages or no coverage. So our job is to make sure that we're there wherever they are, and we can help them navigate the systems, answer the questions, uh, get the right coverage uh, from the connector, uh, whether it's Medicaid, uh, whatever that is, we have to be ready and willing and able to provide them with the resources they need. Jennifer, this is a tough story to cover um, because uh, as a reporter, as a journalist, you have to explain what the problem is and then you have to explain what people should do and then it's generally in an area where folks don't want to pay attention to it. Uh, and obviously to the points of our other guests, there are also caretakers who are trying to help people who may be disabled or need extra help or need some assistance with language barriers and other cultural barriers. How did you approach covering the story? Because you did a great job making it very clear, which is why I invited you here to do the work for me. Perfect, <laughs> I'll, I'll try it all over again. I think especially in a case like this, the balance that's so delicate can be trying to make sure that people understand the scale of the problem and what they can reasonably expect, while at the same time not causing undue panic. It's really easy to get tied up in sort of the big headline of hundreds of thousands of people are probably going to get news that is new to them at least and not welcome perhaps as well. And so when I was looking at this story, I tried to make sure that I was accounting for regional differences inside Massachusetts too. I was talking to folks who are interested in making sure that not just communities of color and not just kind of uh, disabled or uh, other minority populations were being informed, but also ones where the difficulty is, to Mike Levine's point, that you're gonna need to get people out on doors, that people are going to need to physically tell people out in other parts of the state, look at your mail, answer your phone. So when I was thinking about how to try and explain this as neatly as possible, it was really trying to break it down, keep it simple, and also try not to panic people. Just say, be on the lookout. So Michael Levine, if you're, if you're on, and you did a good job, very good job, by the way, <laughs> Jennifer, again. Michael Levine, if you're on Mass Health, if you're on the connector, what should you be doing right now? Should you be being proactive or should you wait or should you just make sure you are checking your text messages and uh, and your or your information is updated as well your phone numbers and your contact info absolutely so if you've moved you should call us and let us know because we want to make sure that if you need to respond to the blue envelope when we send you one in the mail to provide us updated information we want to make sure we send it to the right address you know, otherwise, aside from updating your contact information, I think the most important thing is to keep an eye out for the mail, for texts, for emails, uh, to make sure that when you do get a request from us to give us a little bit more information, you know, you know that you have about 45 days to, to respond. Um, and it's not just us who, it's not just Mass Health or the connector that someone's gonna be hearing from. They're probably gonna be hearing from their primary care physician at a, at a community health center. Uh, they're probably gonna be hearing from their health plan. Uh, they're gonna be hearing from lots of community partners to keep an eye out for a blue envelope and respond when they receive it. You know, Michael Curry, I'm already feeling the pain of the staff at the health centers. Uh, I know um, how much uh, stress and burnout and churn, to, to your word, has been at all medical facilities across the country, especially uh, primary care physicians and the burnout there, as well as support staff, uh, and now this additional layer of things that, that have to be done. Wouldn't it be great if we could just leave all these people on MassHealth at the status that they are? Uh, 
I, I know you're a data-driven guy, but we, we don't have stats on how this coverage um, improved the outcomes of the people who were covered due to the three-year pause. But I imagine you have some feelings about, about, about that, how things would just be better if we could leave it the way it was. Yes. Yeah, I mean, you know, some of this isn't rocket science. We know that um, people have better outcomes if they have a relationship. They have a coverage, then they have a relationship with a primary care provider. It keeps them out of the emergency room. It keeps them out of inpatient days. It treats their disease. It keeps them healthy with preventive care. Uh, and as we went up from 1.8 to 2.3, that meant that more people had access uh, and they had reliable coverage. Uh, it is concerning. Health centers are on the front line, as Mike Levine knows. What I worry about and keeps me up at night is one, they're dealing with the workforce shortage that everyone's dealing with. And you could have every health center in the, in the state is dealing with uh, losing a provider. That means uh, it could take you a year, year and a half to recruit a new one. That means an access issue. On top of that, they're dealing with deferred care. Many, many people have not come in to get their teeth, their eyes, their substance use disorder, their overall physical health cared for. Redetermination is another aspect of this, I'll call it a tsunami of a lot of different concerns, and we got to mitigate the impact of it. And I think Mike and his team, uh, as well as the, the governor and secretary, are doing a tremendous job. And the federal government is investing in community health workers, people being uh, patient navigators, people being engaged with patients. Come on in. Can we help you? Can we guide you? That's what we should be doing, and, and I, I hope it'll, it'll have the maximum impact. Uh, Michael Levine, I know that we're not um, over COVID. I don't want to at all um, give the false information that the pandemic is over, but we are in a spot at least now where it seems that we're stabilized and we know what's what. But I'm wondering if the, the healthcare industry um, at large is taking this opportunity to, to examine what was done correctly um, and what was not done correctly. And I don't mean in terms of, of vaccines and serving, I mean, in delivering the health care and the staffing issues. Uh, and if that is helping to uh, give some tent poles or some foundation maybe to the idea that if we had better access to affordable, if not free, health care, uh, we might have had better outcomes. Is, is that discussion happening now? You know, I do have to say that we are incredibly fortunate to be in Massachusetts um, in large part uh, for a lot of reasons, but, but MassHealth and the Health Connector together are an integrated system that will allow people to find affordable coverage, whether they're eligible for MassHealth, they're eligible for the connector. And it's really a seamless, uh, a seamless experience for members transitioning from one coverage type to another that will enable them to maintain their access to a primary care doc at a health center, or it will enable them to you know, keep on whatever pharmacy regimen they are on. And that's something that a lot of other states don't have. You know, to your question about you know, what, what has this access meant and, and did we get it right? You know, here at MassHealth, we are really focused on creating an integrated primary care based model for all of our members through accountable care organizations um, and through a primary care model that our health centers, our hospitals and our physician groups are all building together over the next few years. And I think even as we go back to, you know, what I'll call business as usual, where you got to check your eligibility every year to maintain mass health, I think it's really critical that whether you got Medicaid, you're on the connector, you're on a commercial plan, you're on Medicare, you have a primary care home that can um, give you the support that you need. And you live in a state where you're not going to experience the kind of coverage gaps that you're going to see elsewhere in the country, where the um, where Medicaid, the health connector, and employers aren't working so closely together. Jennifer, what's the next steps for you at Commonwealth Magazine in covering <laughs> the story? I mean, what happens? Do you follow it all the way along? or I mean, the, the real joy for me is uh, from the hearing that I was covering, there were a few things that Mike Levine pointed out that are actually going to make it easier, not just for journalists to follow this, but also people in general to follow this and community health centers and health advocates, which is a bit more information on the data, seeing where people are losing coverage, why they're losing coverage, who, anonymized, of course, is losing coverage to kind of get a, a handle on the demographics that we're looking at, especially given the areas of concern. I think the other thing to keep in mind that's really struck me throughout this process that I'm going to be keeping an eye on is the emphasis on smooth handoffs. There was a lot of alarm uh, if we could call it that, a concern from lawmakers during the hearing basically saying, we know that when something breaks down, it's not just community health centers that get the call, we get the call. 
our offices might just be flooded with concerned people, and they referred back to what ended up being the situation with unemployment during COVID. Right. So that's still a bad memory in the minds of not just a lot of residents, but also a lot of lawmakers. So uh, I'm looking to see going forward how well Mass Health and the state in general coordinates between different points of contact that people might be running into. Michael Curry, I'll give you the last words. Any any word uh, word to folks watching and uh, to your colleagues uh, across the state? One is I just, again, I feel confident that we, we figured it out in COVID. If we can carry those lessons forward, you need community engaged. Uh, you need to make sure the community is at the table and equity centers all this work. We need to drive resources where the most vulnerability is. And in this 300,000 population of folks that are vulnerable, let's make sure that we get them uh, the coverage and they don't fall into the cracks. All right, Michael Levine, Michael Curry, Jennifer Smith, thank you so much for all of your insight on this. I wish you good luck. <laughs> Keep us posted, thank you. For over 20 years, the event Hot Stove Cool Music has been combining music, baseball, and charity in one mega night. The 2000-born brainchild of MLB Baseball Hall of Fame journalist Peter Gammons found partnership a few years later in the foundation to be named later, founded by brothers Paul and former Red Sox GM Theo Epstein, on the heels of that curse-breaking 2004 World Series win. And in the years since, the hot stove cool music stage has been graced by greats like Eddie Vedder, John Legend, and James Taylor. This year, in celebration of the 10-year anniversary of the Red Sox 2013 World Series win, the event will feature an off-the-mound party with appearances from former Red Sox players raising money for the foundation to be named later. I'm joined now by one of the headliners of the event, former Red Sox pitcher and 2004 World Series champion Bronson Arroyo. He's going to be performing with his band, The 04, as well as the CEO and executive director of the foundation to be named later, Elise Najimi. Now, welcome to both of you. First of all, I get so excited when I get to say world champion. As an over 60-year-old, it still is such a thrill for me, as I'm sure it is for both of you. Welcome. So exciting. What else can we expect? What, what can happen at this fabulous, fabulous event, Bronson? Tell me a little bit more about it. Well, it's usually a great night of rock and roll. You know, it was in, in, the, in the old days, I call it the old days, you know, almost been 20 years since we won that World Series. But it used to be six or seven bands playing four or five songs a night and just a hot, you know, dirty rock club that made you feel like you were in CBGBs or something. But um, you know, this year we're going to be doing that city winery and, you know, Ryan Dempster's got the show called Off the Mound, which is kind of like a Jimmy Fallon style show. So you can expect a couple of ex ball players coming up, you know, sitting there being uh, talked to like he's on the Johnny Carson show. He's got a, he's got a house band with some brass guys like Jake Peavy are going to jump up and probably perform a little bit. And my band is going to do a set at the end of the night as well. What kind of music do you play, Bronson, for folks who don't know? You know, it's mostly rock and roll. It's kind of Pearl Jam, Tom Petty, a mixture of uh, a lot of my influences from the early 90s. And, uh, you know, I put a record out on February 17th, and that's what we're going to be performing uh, this year. That's great. Elise, um, for the folks who may not understand the terminology, um, what's a hot stove? Why are we so excited about calling it a hot stove? Oh, um, everything we do, we kind of get creative with from our name of the foundation and hot stove cool music. But like you mentioned, Peter Gammon started Hot Stove Cool Music in uh, early 2000s, and it was in the winter time when there wasn't a lot going on in baseball. And in the winter, you probably know they call the winter season in baseball the hot stove season, which is like what's cooking on the hot stove? Who's trading who? Who's going to go where? Who's not going to go back to what? What deals are going to be made? So Peter thought, you know what? It's hot stove time. Let's play some cool music. Love it. And and a player to be named later is the inspiration for the foundation name, right? Yeah, well, the story goes, um, the, uh, Paul and Theo Epstein started um, the foundation and they didn't know what to name it. So Paul, Theo's twin brother, said, let's just name it later. And Theo said, let's name it after the Major League Baseball trade term player to be named later. Bronson, talk to me a little bit about some of the, the, the charities and things that you do and the foundation do that stay connected that brings the, the charitable aspect of the Baseball Foundation and good works to the communities. 
Yeah, all this money we've raised over all these years, uh, you know, go, go right to New England. It's it's a lot of places like like the base where you're having underprivileged kids, you know, a lot of times from Latin communities um, that are getting an opportunity to, to play baseball, to be taken care of in a way where they have the opportunity to get scholarships. And Peter Gammons has given out, you know, I think, is it 270 at least scholarships over the years? And absolutely, yeah, 70. And all of these kids are, are, are running with the ball and they're turning out to just be rock stars in the world and really paying it forward into the community. And it is it is such a tight knit group of people, but you can feel so much love when we show up to some of these places and how uh, appreciative they are of our time and of our money. And these kids are really taking the ball and running with it and doing great things in their own lives as well. Elise, can you share a story with me of, of someone that you've encountered that that the foundation has has helped or touched or someone who's impacted you that you've done work with? through the foundation? Um, I mean, I have literally 270 stories, <laughs> but one of my favorite stories is um, Leslie was one of our first scholars that we ever selected 11 years ago. She came with her family from the Dominican. They had nothing. They didn't even speak English. And we selected her as a scholar. She um, got to go to her dream school, UMass Amherst. She went, we stayed with her for four years. She has, uh, we give every scholar an amazing caring mentor. And she went on to law school, which was her dream. And she got her law degree and graduated and we stuck with her. And now she runs our entire scholarship program. That's it's amazing. amazing. Yeah, that's amazing. Talk, and, and this isn't just during the hot stove season. The foundation does work all, all year long, all the time, right? Yeah. Well, yes. Uh, in Boston and Chicago, we're a full-time foundation. Um, hot Stove Co Music is our signature event that raises the money because Bronson and Peter and Theo, all they want to do is have a really fun time and do a lot of good. So we don't do boring events. We do really fun <laughs> events. And we do a lot of good, um, and we do our signature program. We named it after Peter Gammons. It's called the Peter Gammons Scholarship Program because he started Hot Stove, which really is our signature fundraiser event. So now we have 270 kids. Most have overcome the odds to get to college. They're such good kids. They have um, a, a high financial need. They have a commitment to service. And we have a 98% college graduation rate. That's amazing. And we're proud of that because they each have a mentor and a group of people like Bronson and and Peter and Dempster and PV and you know Bernie Williams. All these people care about them, and they really, the big hearts make a difference. Each person, including Bronson, um, Eddie Vedder, James Taylor, they donate their time and talent to hot stove so all the money can go straight to the kids. It's a shame you can't get any big names though. That's that's really, <laughs> maybe there's an aspirational moment to that, right? <laughs> it's just an oh, amazing yeah. lineup, amazing lineup. Ross, I imagine for you, I mean, it's great to, to do good work and it's great to, to, to give to the communities and give to the folks um, that, that support baseball and that you want to support baseball, but it must be a blast for you too to continue to have this brotherhood of baseball where you're doing something that you love doing, in this case, playing music and helping, helping the communities. Absolutely. Seeing, seeing the guys, you know, standing on the stage with a guy like Bernie Williams, who was a, an adversary for so many years with the Yankees, has been, a, you know, a joy in, in the afterlife of baseball. And also, you know, part of the reason why my band, the 04 band, is even together is because of this charity. These were all New England guys who played in big bands around the world with people like Miley Cyrus. And we all came together at this event and would play a lot of cover songs over the years with me. I needed a backing band and it turned into 20 years later, a band of my own and, and writing these songs. And so in a lot of ways, this charity has jump-started my music career and is kind of really near and dear to my heart and to see some of the old guys come back um, and, and, you know, guys like Kevin Millar or anybody who shows up, Lenny DiNardo, you know, these guys are just fantastic, you know, teammates and they were great friends and we don't get to see each other as much as we would like, so it's always a ball. Elise, if folks want to, if they can't make the event, how can they be connected? How can they help the foundation to be named later throughout the year? Uh, are there volunteer opportunities? Are there donation opportunities? Absolutely. Yes. Thank you. So like I said, um, we're always looking for opportunities for our scholars. We are looking for internships for our scholars so that they can get their dream jobs. We're looking for um, people to mentor our scholars. And we usually find our mentors within our circle of hot stove cool music supporters. 
Um, and we also need donations. Every penny counts because we stay with our scholars for four years and we work with the nonprofits that champion them. Um, so our website, we're so excited. We love our new website. There's a donate button right there at the top and you don't have to type out foundation to be named later. <laughs> just type out the initials F T B N L dot org. Um, there's a cool hot stove, cool music history section. You can see pictures of Bronson and all of our headliners, all of our MCs, all of our bandmates, all of our all-stars. Um, and it's just a, a good place to learn more about what we do, our new website. But thank you for um, asking that. It, it takes a village. It does indeed. All right, Bronson Arroyo, I'll let you take us out. You can plug the event one more time before we wrap up. All right, it's the hot stove, cool music at City Winery. It's going to be on uh, April 15th, and uh, oh, doors are at 6. We're opening up at 7.30, and it's going to be a great show. You never know who could show up. It could be David Ortiz, Pedro Martinez, or Dustin Pedroia. So, you know, come enjoy yourself. All right. Good job, Bronson. You're coming for my job next. I can feel it. All right, Bronson and Elise, thanks so much for joining us. Again, for more information on the foundation and the event, you can head over to ftpnl.org. That's it for tonight, but come back tomorrow for Talking Politics. Mass GOP Chair Amy Carnevale will join Adam Riley on the Trump indictment and whether it complicates her push to remake the state's GOP party. Plus, what's driving the growing conservative push to ban books in the South Coast public schools? That and more tomorrow at 7. Thanks for watching. Have a good night.